Next up in our exploration of space is topic G, which is entitled Threats to the Earth. Um, there's actually three little sections to this one. The first bit is how was the moon formed? The second was a little bit on comets, but most of it we've already talked about. And the final bit is on uh, what we call NEOs or near Earth objects. And those are the bits that are th the threats to the Earth, really. So let's start with the origins of the moon. So um, when the solar system was forming, there were loads and loads of chunks of rock orbiting the sun because the sun and the solar system all formed from one big cloud of dust and most of it went into the sun and the little bits that didn't quite go in got pulled together by gravity to form the planets and there were two of these chunks um, which were quite close together and they became planets those two planets then collided now both the planets had iron cores and the iron cores merged together so the centres of the two planets during the collision merged together and they became one big planet. In the collision, though, some of the rock, some low-density rock, was sort of thrown into space near the larger planet, but not part of it. That low-density rock then squashed together and formed a smaller orbiting rock. Now, that smaller orbiting rock was the moon, and the big bit with the iron core left behind was the Earth. So that's just how the moon formed. Two planets, or two smaller planets, collided together, they merged, and the debris that came off orbited the planet, and that's the moon. So for the higher paper, you need to be able to um, cite some evidence for this. So the evidence for it is that um, the Earth is more dense than the moon, because it's the low-density rock, low rock that became the moon. There's no iron in the moon. And that's because the two iron cores merged when the two planets collided. So the bits that spun off to be the moon, there was no iron in them, which is what we see. And um, the rocks from the moon have the same oxygen composition as rocks from the Earth. So that means that they kind of came from the same place originally at one point. And that's because they both came from the, this collision of these two planets. Now, if we look at rocks from other planets, on, um, so like the rocks we've got from Mars or meteorites that have come down to Earth, they have different oxygen compositions, so we know that they were formed in different ways. So that's just the three bits of evidence you need to be able to know about. Okay, comets. Well, we've already talked about comets quite a bit on the um, topic before, just because, you know, I had to mention them, so I talked about them. There's nothing else you really need to know. Um, just a couple little details. So when we're talking about these elliptical orbits, um, Mercury and Pluto, so Mercury being the closest planet, Pluto being the furthest away. Comets get closer to the Sun than Mercury, so that would be in this bit of their um, trajectory here, so this bit around here whilst they're near the Moon, near the Moon, near the Sun, and they go further out than Pluto. So you can imagine Pluto's here, and this is Pluto's orbits around the Sun. They go further out than that, and Mercury might be, well, where my red line is, and they go closer in than that. So they take very, very elliptical orbits rather than nice circular ones. Um, the tails only appear when they're near the sun and point away, and they travel fastest when they're near the sun because of stronger gravitational attraction. So that should all be pretty much stuff we knew already. Just the detail about getting closer than Mercury and further away than Pluto is new. Okay, so asteroids. Asteroids are kind of just like miniature planets. They're just chunks of rock that just haven't... Um, either formed into a larger planet or are only loosely attracted to other things. Um, now, gravity is what attracts things in space and it always generally wants to form bigger objects. However, if you remember, the asteroid belt in our solar system is between the inner and the outer planets, so it's between Mars and Jupiter. Now, the asteroids... If there were no other planets around, they would all attract together and would end up with sort of a planet or a couple of planets. But they're also attracted to the planets that are near them. So they're planeted, uh, planeted, attracted to the planet Jupiter and they're attracted to each other and a little bit they're attracted to Mars as well. Now because of these uh, competing attractions and because of Jupiter's orbit around them, they never form together into anything. They just always float around separately because they're being pulled in different directions all the time. So that's why we have the asteroid belt and why it's um, formed the way it has because it's been pulled in all different directions. 
Okay, asteroid impacts. So, if an asteroid were to hit a planet, it can cause craters, fires, volcanic eruptions, it can cause clouds of dust to be emitted into the atmosphere, which can then go on and cause climate change, and all these things can lead to the extinction of species. So, we know these have happened on the planet Earth. And the evidence for the fact that they've happened is we see these crater sites and iridium, this is a, uh, an element that isn't normally found near the surface of the Earth. When there have been these craters, we can find iridium near the surface, which means it's kind of been thrown up or it's been brought on the meteors. It shows there's been a big disturbance. What we also see is there are change in the fossils. So um, what we might see is that we find animals all the way up till we suddenly get this layer of iridium and then we don't see those fossils anymore. And that could be that that animal's been made to go extinct because of the, meteor uh, the asteroid impact. But evidence for these um, impacts are we're looking at disturbed fossils or fossils being in a different order or fossils disappearing and um, finding unusual elements in different places. Iridium is the specific example, but if we just talk about it in terms of there being unexpected elements in unexpected places, we've got the idea. Okay, so near-Earth objects. These are objects that are likely to at some point come near the Earth, which could potentially be dangerous, because as I've said, asteroid impacts can cause extinction. I don't know about you, but I kind of don't fancy extinction. Um, so what we have to do is try and track some of these objects that could potentially impact on the Earth. And we have to do that by making lots of observations with lots of telescopes. And it's really quite difficult to predict if they're actually going to make an impact or how close they're going to come. Because of A, the distances that are involved are huge. So if we're only off, you know, if our calculations are off by like half a percent, that would be the difference between, say, hitting us and maybe not even entering our solar system. So there's a lot of uncertainty in these until they get closer. So it can be very difficult to figure out exactly where they are uh, or exactly where they're going to go because of all these uncertainties and we might not know everything that's going to have an effect on their path. Um, now for the higher paper you need to know what we might do if there was an NEO on track for the planet. Um, if it was it could kill all life and the only option would be to try and destroy it before it gets too close to the planet. It's like a Hollywood uh, movie pitch, isn't it? In fact, I'm pretty sure there's been at least one with this, with this theme. But the idea is we'd have to try and send explosives up to break it down into something smaller or to try and deflect its path away from the Earth. All these things would be extremely difficult to do. And... Um, Chances of us spotting one before they hit us is quite small, um, you know, soon enough for us to do something about it, and the chances of us being able to do something about it are also quite slim. So it's a pretty bleak outlook, really. Um, but fortunately, nothing's happened yet, and the chances of it happening are actually pretty slim, given how big the universe is. For something to actually hit us, we're pretty insignificant in the scale of the universe, so it's quite unlikely. So you can cling to our insignificance as hope for the future. Um, okay, so that is it on um, threats to the Earth. So we're done. Only one more topic left, and then we are done and dusted with our GCSE in science. So remember, any questions, do not hesitate to ask me.